Christmas, 1968, when man first cut the silver cord of Earth's gravity to orbit the moon. Saturn V had provided the power to take him there. The command and service modules had sustained him. But man cannot begin his mastery of the moon until he can land on its inhospitable surface and take off again. To do this, he needs the third basic piece of hardware, the lunar module. The lunar module is a new concept designed exclusively for use in the vacuum of space. A two-man taxi used as a shuttle between the lunar surface and the orbiting command module. But before men can use the lunar module as an operational lunar spacecraft, it must be tested in space, first in Earth orbit. This was the primary purpose of Apollo 9, the third manned Apollo mission. Jim McDivitt, Dave Scott, Rusty Schweikert, three men to qualify this new machine, to make ready for the moon. This was the most complex system ever sent into space. First, the Saturn V, seven and a half million pounds of thrust from its first stage alone, over three million working parts. Then the lunar module, well over one million parts. And the command and service modules, over two million parts. 35 seconds in counting. March 3rd, 1969, the countdown for the launch of Apollo 9 was underway. Each piece checked out before launch. The computer monitors. 20 seconds. Guidance release. 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. We have ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engines running. Commit. Liftoff. We have liftoff at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Once in orbit, the crew turned the command module around preparatory to the docking with the lunar module, which was still attached to the S-4B, the third stage of their launch vehicle. And this is Houston. All right, it's out there, and uh, we're turned around and uh, proceeding uh, with the station keeping it docking. Oh, tremendous, uh, Paul Martin. Thank you. Go, Apollo 9. We're about 25 feet now on the closing point. Uh, copy. Alright, Houston, we're hard dock. Apollo 9, understand hard dock. Good show. The next maneuver, to activate the springs which would eject the lunar module command module configuration from the S-4B. Apollo 9, you are go for ejection. Next, the S-4B engine would be ignited to send it away from Apollo 9, away from possible interference with their complex mission. Apollo 9, uh, Houston. Looks like we're going to be right down his tailpipe. Ignition on the S-4B. It's on the way. It's just like a bright star disappearing in the distance. 
For the rest of the first and second days, Apollo 9 would fly in this configuration. Four burns of the service propulsion system would optimize the orbit for the coming maneuvers. These burns could be roughly correlated to the mid-course corrections of a lunar mission. Then, on the third day, the crew cleared the tunnel connecting the command and lunar modules of the probe and drogue docking mechanism. This would open the tunnel for the transfer of McDivitt and Schweikert from the command module to the lunar module. Uh, Houston, just for your info, the uh, tunnel clearing went uh, pretty much according to plan. Apollo 9, Houston's reading your line clear. Roger, I know another piece of info for you. The uh, drogue looks as good as new. Uh, Roger, Apollo 9. With two spacecraft now in operation, new code names were introduced. The cone-shaped command module known as Gumdrop, the insect-like lunar module called Spider. Throughout the day, McDivitt and Schweikert would test every system of the lunar module. The major event of the day would be a burn of the lunar module descent engine. This engine, which will eventually be used for the actual lunar landing, would be under the manual control of spacecraft commander McDivitt for a large portion of the burn. Okay, ignition. Now, McDivitt put on a virtuoso performance, playing the throttle of the lunar module, each variation of thrust a note in a technological symphony. Starting the throttle. 40%. Going down to 10%. Coming back up to 40%. Coming back down to 25%. Back up again. Okay, coming up to 40%. Throttle profile is complete. We'll just let it sit there. The engine so necessary for the lunar landing had performed flawlessly. Another burn of the service module engine would complete the day. But first, McDivitt had a message. Okay, I've got to get something to you. I've had so far today is a little bag of fruit salad. I'm about to starve to death. Roger. It had been a busy time for the crew of Apollo 9, but it was only the beginning. The next day, McDivitt and Schweikert returned to the lunar module. This time, Schweikert opened the front hatch and stepped onto the front porch, the first all-up test in space of the Portable Life Support System, or PLSS, and the suit to be worn on the moon. Schweikert was attached to the lunar module only by a safety tether. With his own life support and communication systems, he was virtually an independent one-man spacecraft. His call sign as the third link in communications, Red Rover. Alone in the command module, hatch opened, Dave Scott also had work to do. Okay, Dave, come on out. Yeah, you want to retrieve a sample? Uh, right, that's a good idea. Now, both Scott and Schweikert were retrieving experimental thermal samples attached to the exteriors of the lunar and command modules. Because of Schweikert's upset stomach the previous day, his extravehicular transfer from the lunar module to the command module, to be used if the transfer tunnel were blocked, was curtailed. But the remaining EVA, which lasted for 37 minutes, demonstrated not only that an extravehicular transfer was possible, but gave a good workout to the spacesuit and life support system that will later be worn when exploring the surface of the moon. It had been another long, hard day, the first and only EVA scheduled for Apollo until the exploration of the lunar surface. But the next day was the biggest test of them all, with McDivitt and Schweikert in the lunar module, Scott alone in the command module, the two vehicles undocked. Looking more an abstraction than a machine, the lunar module danced an inverted pirouette before its lone partner in space.
Firing its descent engine, the lunar module would pull away from the command module to a distance of about a hundred miles. With the support of mission control, McDivitt and Schweikert would locate Scott alone in the command module and perform the critical rendezvous maneuvers, each burn representing a firing that would one day take men from the surface of the moon to the spacecraft, which would take them home again. 20 seconds. We have ignition. Burn looks good. It's a good burn, Dave. Oh, very good. Thank you. The lunar module had left its bulky four-legged descent stage in orbit. Now only the ascent stage and crew would return. Each burn a step in a computerized choreography which would lead to the rendezvous. In order to dock, McDibbett needed to use a sighting device on the lunar module docking window. However, the brilliance of the sunlight made using the sight difficult. Alone in the command module, Scott helped talk McDibbett in. Well, you're coming fine. Just keep coming easy like that. I'm gonna go uh, forward to your right a little bit, relative to your body. Well, it's translation, but I can't tell what my attitude is, Dave. If I don't see it, so there it is there. Now you're coming in. Come. You're almost there. You're about there. I have captured. Very good. Okay. Why don't you take a break for a while? Man, when I take a break, I'm going to bed for three days. It had been a full five days, but the lunar module had checked out beyond expectations. In all aspects, it seemed ready for the moon. Now it was time to jettison the ascent stage of the lunar module to free the command module for the remainder of the mission. When a safe clearance had been established, the final test, the ascent engine of the lunar module was ignited to burn until its propellant ran out. The crew of Apollo 9 watched as their lunar module, now crewless, arced away from them. Hey, let's really move out. I hope I didn't forget anything. I'm bored. Are you sure a long ways away? For the last five days, the flight of Apollo 9 settled into a routine, a routine of picture taking and observations with an occasional burn to refine the orbit. But this routine was a look into the future, a future when manned orbiting space stations operating in concert with unmanned scientific satellites could examine the Earth from this vantage point. When cameras such as those on Apollo 9 will take multiple spectrum photographs from visible light through the infrared, locating hitherto untapped geological and biological resources. And perhaps even more important, when man can look at his world with a new perspective, quantitatively and qualitatively observe the results of his actions on the face of his world. For with the power man controls, he can change the nature of his planet. He can no longer think of unrelated occurrences. He must realize that he exists within the structure of Earth's planetary ecological system. He can observe with this new technology the results of his interaction with his environment. Water pollution on the coast of the United States. Air pollution of a major city. The results of damming a river of irrigating a desert. But Apollo 9 was not an orbiting laboratory. 
It was the third manned mission of Apollo, and it was time to come down. The prime recovery area had been shifted several hundred miles because of weather conditions in the original recovery zone. With the appropriate changes made to its flight path, Apollo 9 made its final descent into the atmosphere. The crew took these pictures of the re-entry and opening of the parachutes. The 10-day mission of Apollo 9 had met all its major goals. The ability to work and make a contingency transfer in the spacesuit and the PLSS had been proven. The capability of the lunar module to fulfill its vital role in the exploration of the moon had been established. The flight of Apollo 9 showed that we are indeed ready, ready for the next step in meeting what may be the most significant challenge of our time, the conquest of the moon. <laughs>